talking about my species, so it's not altogether simple. But talking about inanga, they spawn mostly in the autumn, although there are records of them spawning on almost every month of the year. But I think the big spawnings are probably in March, April. And the shoals of adults migrate downstream into the estuaries on the spring tides. And nobody knows how they know it's the spring tide because they migrate up from further upstream than the tidal influence. But they seem to know. And they spawn amongst the vegetation on the banks of the streams at the high spring tides. So that when they're actually spawning, they're in amongst grass and stuff along the riverbanks. And the eggs uh, are fertilised, and in the old days, they used to call them cowfish because you can see where they've been spawning the milt, milt from the white bait spawning. You can actually see it in the river. And of course, when there are huge shoals of white bait spawning, I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot of water that's influenced. Anyway, when the tide goes down, the eggs are left in amongst the moist vegetation around the along the riverbanks, and they develop over two, three, four weeks in the moist air, they're, in the, they're not in water at all, they're not, they're not covered by water. And then when the next set of spring tides comes, as long as it's not been too cold, they'll hatch and the larvae will, will hatch and get swept back into the river flows and get carried out to sea. And that's usually, as I say, March, April. And they spend the winter in the sea feeding and growing and then they come back up in the springtime. And the adults typically die after spawning so you've got basically an annual life cycle. Now the other species are less known, but it is known that Banda kokapu, Shortjaw kokapu and Kawaro all lay their eggs in places where they'll be exposed to the air when they develop. They, they, they spawn during floods or freshes, mostly in small streams in the bush. And the eggs are laid and they either settle in amongst the litter along the margins of the of the streams or in amongst the gravels. Kawaro typically spawn the eggs are just in amongst the gravels. So it's a pretty risky life cycle because um, they have to then develop and wait till there's another flood before they hatch. And if a flood doesn't come soon enough, then they don't hatch and they just die. So they run out of energy before then. When fish grow, they lay down a layer on this bone in the ear called the otolith, a layer every day. And you can get the otolith out and grind it and look at it under a microscope and you can count the number of days old they are. And in fact, there are probably some growth rings that actually form before they hatch. And I could show you a photograph of, a, um, of the otolith and you can see the hatch mark. And sometimes you can see a few growth rings inside it. So you can count how many days they've been at sea and we've done that. I've done that for all four, for four of the five species. And you're talking about usually something between 120 and 180 days. Depends on the species of either. We don't really know. There have been records of up to 700 kilometres offshore. But whether those are fish that will come back to New Zealand or are just ones that might get lost in the middle of the ocean, we have no idea. Well, most of the white bait that the fishermen catch are inunga white bait. And most people seem to know about inunga. The little fellas about what up to 60 or 70 millimetres, but they get bigger, you can get them 150 millimetres long. And then the second species is the Kawaro or Galaxis brevipinus, people tend to call that mountain trout. And it's the same fish as occurs in the uh, high country lakes throughout the South Island, there's a white backed light fish there, the same species, but they're landlocked. And it's kind of milky, um, as I say, it's the run bait, the one that comes in soonest after floods. And it's the one that you get big numbers in, in the rivers that are snow-fed, like the Haast and the Arawata, sometimes the Waitoto, Karangarua. Um, it seems to be able to tolerate high turbidity better than the other species do. Third species is your Bandicokapu. And Bandicokapu tend to run a little bit later in the season. They're the smallest white bait. They can be slightly goldy coloured, and some of the white baiters call them golden bait. Both Kawaro and Bandicokapu white bait will climb out of your bucket. If you get short jawed cocoa, Bandicokapu on the eastern slopes of the Tararua Ranges in the headwaters of the Manawatu. So those fish have gone all the way up the, from the sea at Foxton 
all the way, 50, 60 miles up to the Manitou Gorge and through the gorge and then way south along the Mangatanoka. The fourth species is a giant kokapu, and that's um, quite rare. It occurs only probably in the beginning, from the beginning of November onwards, so it doesn't actually make much up, up, make up much of the fishery. And of course, um, there's a big jump of faith to go from a giant kokapu white bait to a giant kokapu because they're great big beggars. And the fifth one is a thing that we call short jaw kokapu, and we don't know anything about its white bait at all because we can't actually identify them. Um, I suspect that they're mixed up amongst the Kawaro white bait, and part of the problem is that Kawaro white bait is so much more abundant, so you're, off, you're looking at a needle in a haystack trying to find short jaw kokapu white bait. You're probably wondering how we know we have them. Well, one of my staff collected some white bait from the Buller River in 1964, brought them back, and we reared them in the lab, and he got 11 white bait back alive, and it had all five species in it. So we know, there's no question that uh, short jaw cocker will have a white bait, we can't distinguish them. And no matter how we try, we haven't been able to so far. We had a series of traps up the Waiatota River in the, in the big program back in the late 60s. Banded white whitebait would tend to run up into the really dark brown tannin stained forest streams. And the Kawaro whitebait would just shoot straight on up river. And the Banded Kokobu whitebait would avoid getting into water that came out of warmish swamps, so they wanted cold water. So we got them to partition, and you, I mean, it's really quite an interesting picture, interesting story. And you can, so each, each species has different sorts of water that it chooses to run into. But at the same time, they run into them together, so they, they come up and mix shells, and as I say, they're sort of partition. They don't home. I'm oh, absolutely sure they don't home. They choose the rivers they come into quite carefully. Well, the golden bait are the, are the white bait of Banner Kokobu. And they're slightly amber coloured. Oh, does that look good or what? <laughs> that looks good. Arawata, they get a lot of white, uh, a lot of kawaro bait because it runs Ooh. milky. Sometimes 70, 80% of the catch. There's a lot more white baited than there used to be, Bob. Do you think that's having an effect on the fisheries? We haven't got a faintest idea. Nobody knows. I mean, apart from anything else, most of their life is spent at sea. We don't know what they do. We don't know where they go. We don't know what affects their abundance. We don't know what, why they some, have some seasons are better than the others. But it seems to me that while the fishery is continuing to go up as well as down, you can't be overfishing it. If you, if you make the assumption that, and it's probably true that in most parts of New Zealand, 95% of the white bait are, are inanga. They're annual species. So they'll respond very rapidly to uh, overfishing. If you overfish an annual species, the fishery just collapses. And it's gone up and down. And I said to you before, um, Robbie Nolan used to talk, talk to me about some seasons in the 1930s where they couldn't catch a feed. And they keep going up and the fishery keeps going up and down. Now that said, I suspect there may be quite strong influences, historical influences from habitat deterioration particularly away from the west coast. Um, I mean, the rivers of Canterbury, for instance, they've just been you know, developed and drained and abstracted to the point, so habitat is certainly likely to be affecting them. But as I say, we don't know. There are no figures. I mean, you know, who knows what the influences of ocean currents are? I mean, two or three years ago, they had a west coast type season down on the Opa here. They're catching them by the kerosene tin pool. Where do they come from? I don't know. There are a lot of wise people out there, but they don't know much. We can pretty much predict that it's going to continue to decline just because of habitat development. Um, you know, I mean, there used to be vast wetlands along the Canterbury coastline. I mean, huge, tens of thousands of hectares of wetland. They're gone. The element of gold mining in it. You never know what's going to turn up. And uh, it catches people's imagination. 